And our final speaker before we have a break is uh, Vanessa Blé Tremblay. And she's actually in, in, jointly in the departments of music and women's studies. And she's going to talk to us about some of the historical treatment of jazz musicians and um, how we need to learn from the treatment in the past to make sure that the treatment in the future is excellent. Vanessa. Um, where's the clicker? Oh, is that it? Great. Hi, everyone. In a new century that is marked by increasingly, whoops, how does this work? Okay, okay, great. In a new century that is marked by increasingly scarce resources and upsurges of ethnic nationalist discourses in this and in other parts of the world, it is essential that we as researchers and as historians insist on the defining part that people of color and foreign born citizens have played in the shaping of what most makes us, us as Canadians. The past two provincial elections in Quebec capitalized precisely on anxieties around issues of race and ethnicity in order to divide and conquer the electorate. And debates around the varying levels of access to the judicial system between women who wear veils in front of the court, for instance, or um, between missing indigenous women and missing non-indigenous women are sure uh, to be harnessed in the upcoming federal election. Yet, despite current ideological tendencies to frame ethnic Canadians as somewhat less belonging to national discourses, as soon as we scratch the surface of our histories, we cannot fail to recognize the economical, cultural, and political significance that non-white and foreign-born citizens have had. My work on the golden age of jazz in Montreal points to an important gap between Quebec's past and its sense of history. Why don't Montreal jazz men and jazz women appear in histories of Quebecois music, along with um, singer-songwriter Félix Leclerc and fiddler jean Sigean Carignan, for instance, despite the fact that dancing Le Charleston belongs to the memories of most of those who came of age uh, during the interwar years? More alarmingly, the link between this city's international reputation for good times with the economic benefits that this has entailed for almost a century and the importance of the black community in developing Montreal's in night nightclub industry has been all but forgotten. It was in fact out of our province's need for black train porters to travel across the US border that the corn crocs of Montreal showbiz grew. <clears throat> Specifically, it was at the sites of black women's sexual labor that Montreal's jazz scene developed. To be blunt and concise, jazz was advertised here less as a sonic phenomenon or even a musical genre in the traditional sense than as a black female teasing body. My research into the archives of Montreal's jazz scene shows that the visibility thus acquired by black female dancers figured prominently the transformation of gender ideals and sexual practices in a state that was still openly Catholic and socially conservative until the late 1950s. In other words, the advent of jazz in Montreal marked a crucial moment in the appreciation of modern identities and pleasures in Quebec, and our histories of women's rights should better acknowledge the importance that black women's labor on stage has had in the trajectory towards the so-called sexual revolution of the 1960s. Now, at this very moment in time, there's about one story available to ethnic communities in Quebec. They come from the outside. They are just in transit. First, repositioning the role that the black community has had in the development of Montreal's tourism economy and that black women in particular have had in the transformation of gender and sexual roles in Quebec can help unveil the utter falsity of such a narrative. Even more importantly, historical research allows us to identify similarities between current ethnic nationalist discourses and the strategies of distancing that also emerged during the worst period of, of scarcity that Quebec encountered in the past century, the Great Depression. The jazz shows were advertised as coming straight from Harlem, despite the fact that they featured local musicians and local dancers. More insidiously, the exoticized bodies of black female dancers in performance and in the press worked conjointly to shape views of non-white women as de facto outsiders, regardless of their citizenship. Surely, Cream, the exotic danseuse, and Bertie Warfield, that gardenia girl from Tahiti, and in particular, the costumes of uh, some of these dancers had no previous exposure to Quebec's winter weather, right? <laughs> The problem, the problem with such processes of distancing is that they obscure the recognition that non-white and foreign-born Canadians are equally ours 
equally deserving of taxpayers' money of federal and provincial services institutions, equally deserving of the Canadian Charter of Rights. Against a national average of unemployment of 28% during the worst of the Great Depression, more than 80% of Montreal's black community was unemployed. Now, what am I to end this presentation with? Those who don't know history are bound to repeat it. Je me souviens. Ages of scarcity are divisive. Any look at Depression era Montreal teaches us as much. And ethnic nationalist discourses have very material impacts on the lives on, of non-white and foreign-born citizens, as well as on the very possibility of maintaining social peace within the geographical boundaries of this nation. But a sense of solidarity can be helped today by appealing to the collective memories of a shared cultural past between the local and the foreign-born and between the white and non-white citizens of Canada. What knowledge will Canadians need in order to thrive in a global, interconnected world? To remember who we are and how we came to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have questions for Vanessa? I'll start with one. Um, in the jazz age that you're talking about, what was the population or percentage of the population in Montreal that was black? It's a fascinating question. It's hard to say because much of the population was um, the black community, black male community was working on trains. And so there's a discrepancy between the actual numbers of people that um, were um, uh, featured in the, the census, for instance, and the visibility that the black community had at the time. Uh, there are touring shows that came from Harlem every summer that spent a couple of months here in Montreal, and yet these numbers are not acknowledged um, in any kind of official document. Uh, more, more importantly than the number, because it's true that the black community was arguably quite small compared to, for instance, the black community in the US, um, it's the visibility that was acquired by the, the black community in the that jazz age that I think is more important, regardless almost of how many um, non, how many members of the black community there were, um, the three clubs that were advertised as the most uh, popular places to enjoy jazz, to enjoy modernity and modern pleasures were the black clubs in the corners. So that's the corner of Saint Antoine and uh, De La Montagne for the fellow Montrealers in the room. Um, so the, a discrepancy between numbers and visibility at the time, if that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Then please join me in thanking Vanessa and all of our speakers this afternoon.